one. Ah, you're looking, yes, it is a good noon. Uh -huh. And we're so happy you're here celebrating with Ken Ronaldo, the amazing, what is this, kind of a vocation, a call. I hope so. I, I sense that as you have from uh, a, a young age, 18 or so, and you lived in Manhattan, New York, and deciding uh, in going to college that you wanted to combine art with technology. Well, when did that start in you? I mean, living in Long Island, um, tell us uh, how that got started in you. Well, it may have started at a much younger age than 18 because both of my parents were contemporary okay, artists. And um, they, uh, they uh, basically, for what? they were both contemporary artists. Uh -huh. And my grandfather was also an artist um, who escaped uh, from Italy and eloped with a beautiful woman from Paris. Ah. And he was really a great artist, but he died, unfortunately, when he was very young. And after World War II, he and my mother met in um, New York. So, but you know, as a child, we spent a lot of time at museums in New York City. Uh, we would go to both art museums, but we would also go to science museums. So I think at a very young age, I was really inspired by the Rose Planetarium, by oh, yes. the Metropolitan Museum of Art, by the Museum of Modern Art, by the Whitney Museum, all the great museums of New York. Um, and so, yeah, I was very inspired as a young age by seeing both their work, but also seeing it works of the great masters uh, from around the world. Wonderful. I was sharing in conversation that as I've taught in Manhattan for six years, I got to experience through our programs all these wonderful exhibits and museums, including science. And I sensed in the students something about this technological beginning in the 70s when I was teaching, and I thought, What's happening here? You knew what was happening. Well, it, it just seemed to me like a very natural connection, art and science. And if we we look back at maybe some of the great masters, perhaps if we look at you know Leonardo da Vinci, we would say, well, there was never really an absolute notion of art or science. There were just people asking questions about the nature of our universe. Uh -huh. And uh, in a way, I think the hypothesis show is really a good example of that because both the arts and scientists ask hypotheses. They ask hypotheses sometimes that are very similar, like what is the nature of our universe? Uh, sometimes we would imagine that artists would go toward the aesthetic side of knowing things, but the truth is, is that uh, artists uh, have always made art with the um, mud and the water by the river. Uh, the only difference now is that the river is inflammation and the mud is silicon. Uh -huh. So this changes everything. And this is now the age of new media art. Wow. So you teach at Ohio State University? Yes. The second in rating for combining art and technology. Well, yeah, we, I teach in a program, my wife Amy Youngs and I teach in a program called Art and Technology. And we're actually the largest program in the Department of Art. It seems that a lot of students are really excited by um, learning about technology because it's one of the, the most expressive forms we know of today. Um, and we are also greatly honored to get this ranking of being number two in 3D animation in the United States, just behind uh, UCLA. So that was really a big surprise to all of us because none of us really like overtly went after animation. We just knew that the students really wanted to know that. And if we have time today, I'm actually going to, at the very end of this uh, presentation, show you a piece that, in fact, nobody has seen before. Uh, it's a piece called The Continuous War Train, and it's about the U.S. obsession with military weapons and our military industrial complexes. It's a little bit of a dark piece, as war would be, but um, I think this, this might be the first time anybody actually sees this project. Uh, so we'll, we'll see how time goes and whether or not we have time. Well, thank you, again. and lead us on. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, you know, I'd like to begin by showing you a little bit about my process and the kind of things that I do. 
Um, I began in a very practical way, thanks to my mom. Uh, moms are so good at uh, helping us to try to do practical things. And I was studying dance in New York City uh, for many years, ballet. My intent was to become a ballet dancer. Uh, but I realized after watching Varishnikov dance uh, that I would never be a great dancer. I started far too late in my career. But, you know, the, the good thing is, is that it convinced me to look in other directions. I was working at the time as a machine operator sewing for a living in a high fashion shop in Soho. I was surrounded by great artists like Kenny Scharf and other great Soho artists of the day. Um, and my mother realized that I was really struggling to survive and she said, come on out to California. I'm going to put you through school. And so I thought, wow, that's pretty good. And she said, we think you should study computer science because that's a practical thing to do. So I went and I earned my degree in computer science. And uh, even though I studied a language now which is all but obsolete called COBOL, common all purpose business language. But it really got me to look at and think about computers. I was already excited by computers. Later, after a number of years of both selling art for a living and also selling computers for a living and uh, not being so pleased and impressed with the business world, uh, I decided just to pursue my own work. I thought at that point I might be homeless. Um, in fact, I was already planning on digging uh, special uh, bunkers under highways because I thought, wow, art just doesn't pay very well. Um, but, you know, the truth is, is that it, it has turned out to be really something that I was passionate about. And I focused for many years on pursuing my, my art career and then just one day showed up at uh, University of the San Francisco State University and um, basically showed my sketchbooks to a professor and he got very, very excited. He said, I want you to meet somebody. And he brought me in to meet uh, somebody who ran a program called CIA, which is Conceptual Information Arts. And really that's where I would say my sort of professional art career began because while I have a degree in computer science and communications from UCSB, uh, I actually have just a master's of fine arts. So I actually didn't study art as an undergraduate. So really, this sense of both the arts and the sciences, especially computer sciences, coming together, I think is true in my case. And a lot of my interest set, in fact, comes from reading the sciences. So today I'd like to show you some works from back then and some current works, including some works that I think show my current concerns about our planet, the survivability of our planet, about issues of global warming, about issues of who we are as individuals, and um, then I'd like to show you an animation. If we still have time, perhaps we could go for a little walk and look at uh, the Spider House movies piece or Borderless Bacteria, Colonialist Cash, and, and uh, also some of the new um, uh, Epiphyte and Moss Gardens. I would um, like to begin by showing you a very early work. Um, this is, um, whoops, in a moment here, exploring the confluence and co-evolution of organic and technological cultures. That's my tagline. And um, the first work I'd like to show you is a work called The Flock. And The Flock was basically the very first uh, artificial life robot that would flock towards sound. I was very interested at that point in could you create a, a series of robots that number one didn't look like normal robots, they were soft materials, and um, would they be able to recognize people's sound and then move toward that sound? So this is a photograph of what they look like. You'll notice it's composed of an unusual material, specifically Cabernet Sauvignon grapevines, and uh, who doesn't love uh, wine? So. So that's a very early work, and that was a collaboration with Mark Grossman, who was actually a, a really amazing um, captain of industry in Silicon Valley, where I happened to live at that point when I was studying to get my degree. And this is somebody interacting with the flock. And I'm now sort of jumping forward. This is a, a piece that I'm hoping shows you some of my process. I, I think I'm somewhat fortunate. I get a good deal of invitations from museums both nationally and internationally to present and create new works. Usually what happens when I get an invitation is I start to 3D model a proposal of what it is that I intend. 
Uh, a curator in Toronto invited me to present a new piece at an exhibition called Nuit Blanche, which is uh, basically uh, tw it's 12 hours of contemporary art. It's a very big show. It happens in Germany, it happens in Paris, it happens in Toronto every year, and many very large cities. So she wanted a piece called the Paparazzi Robots, which I'll show you in a minute. And those are robots that follow you around and take your picture if you smile. So the robots manipulate you to be happy. But she also wanted a new piece that would capture people's faces in some way. And I came up with this idea that perhaps I could create a robot that would move toward people, would then be able to use their facial structure to compose a new sound. And that was the question I asked myself, and it was the proposal I gave to her. And these were some of the early 3D models that I gave to her. She wanted something that would really command attention. She gave me these, basically the equivalent of Times Square in Toronto, which is Young Dundas Square. This is a photograph of me building the robot. She said to me that the sculpture needed to survive a 45 mile per hour wind in driving rain. She also said lots of people would likely be drunk. She said you need to make sure that this needs to survive really the most punishing environment. So I knew I needed to use a carbon fiber rod. I knew I needed to use really strong plastics. This shows you some of my process of designing 3D models, which then become rapid prototypes, which is a method of 3D printing an object. This shows you a picture of me in my studio building the uh, top part of the robot. I had really, uh, this shows you the, the plastic being constructed. I had six months to build this project. It was a very nice commission. It was very generous. So it also allowed me to have a budget to hire two of my former uh, graduate students to work with me during the summer. And this is me constructing the robot of carbon fiber rod and cast urethane plastics in my studio. This is what some of the code looks like. This is a program called Max MSP and Jitter. And you'll notice that this image on the left, which is an image of me, the computer breaks that down into a grid of colors. Those colors are then used to generate sound and music. My idea with this piece was, would the robot be able to create something that was maybe different in the way of sound, but also perhaps not necessarily melodic in the way that you would normally associate with sound. And as I started constructing these robots and thinking about the human voice, the robots also looked a little bit cold and naked, if you will. And I thought, well, if you're going to deal with the voice and song, you know, song is a kind of a stand-in for the voice, then what could be better to cover them with but human hair? Strangely, I was actually able to find human hair for sale in, in uh, Columbus, Ohio. And I was able to find it very inexpensively, which completely surprised me. But of course, at that point, I was getting excited by all the hair, and I was able to create various ones. At that point, Michael Jackson had died, so I actually named one after him, being such a great uh, dancer, such a great musician. And one was also named uh, Brangeli, or, you know. Uh, but basically, this is what it looked like at the opening. I had three hours to set it up, and I had three hours to break it down. This is what it looked like at the opening. People really had a good time. They would grab their facial images, project them to projectors on the installation, and then basically sing a song back to them. Six robots, each robot would make its own sound, and then the six together would make a kind of symphony of sound, which was really a reflection of the multicultural elements of the city. Toronto is a really amazing multicultural city, and I was really excited that the faces were launching you know, the song. And what do the sounds sound like? By the way, this was the opening. It was perhaps the largest opening of my life. At any one time, there were about uh, 80 or 90,000 people in the square. That night, they had about 2.4 billion people show up for the exhibitions all around the city. And so this is what it looks like from down below.
another example. <laughs> Stomachs. 
many of you may or may not know, but you know, when you get that funny feeling like something's wrong in your stomach, it's because a lot of those same neurotransmitters, dopamine, epinephrine, actually are in your stomach. When the child is developing as a fetus, there's something called the neural crest. And the neural crest is actually a stomach and the brain in one single unit. And as the child develops, it migrates and becomes the brain and the stomach. So the stomach and the brain are actually very centrally tied. But I was interested in what that meant to evolution. And this was a piece that was commissioned by a museum of science fiction and future journeys in Switzerland for a retrospective. And what it is, is it's a chair in the shape of a giant tongue that is controlled by living bacteria yes, that lives inside. Oh, that's my crazy computer telling me to get to work. Um, and what it does is if the bacteria in the artificial stomach is happy and healthy, then the chair, when you sit in the chair, it automatically reclines and gives you a 15-minute massage. And this is what it looks like. Here's the artificial stomach that then leads back to the chair. And you can see the chair is basically looks like a big giant tongue. This is the stomach itself made of glass. These are cooling liquids moving through these blue tubes. This is what it looks like functioning. Oops. This is a large bacteria, lactobacillus acidophilus, that occupy our own natural stomachs. Our stomachs and intestinal systems are called the enteric nervous system and are certainly seen as forms of intelligence as they possess one thousandth of the numbers of neurons in the human brain and use many of the same neurotransmitters such as dopamine, serotonin, and epinephrine. If the hand and finger can be seen as extensions of our human brain, then the tongue can be thought of as an extension of the enteric nervous system, seeking out what it prefers to ingest. In this installation, an artificial stomach will allow the bacteria within it to activate a functioning robotic chair in the shape of a giant tongue. This giant tongue is designed to give you a comforting massage. The robotic chair is covered with a red eaten leather that gives the appearance of swollen tea spuds and enlarged and hungry tongue. I have chosen in this work to focus on our sense of touch and corporeal experience as a way to explore interactivity, as our largest sense organ is in fact our skin. As peristaltic muscle movements propel food and bacteria through our natural stomachs, so an electronic peristalt pump will artificially replicate these movements as it moves cooling water through the artificial glass stomach. A pH meter will constantly measure the acidity and basicity of the bacteria, and these signals are interfaced to and activate a series of relays and microcontrollers that allow the robotic tongue chair to activate, relax, and massage the viewer interacting. Acid-loving milk bacteria, lactobacillus acidophilus, are the activators of this robotic tongue. Another important element of this installation are two small robotic tongues that dip into and out of chocolate pools located in large glass containers. The containers are held up by large dopamine molecules constructed in steel. The dopamine molecule is believed to mediate the subjective experience of pleasure in humans and other animals. Sugar and fat are two substances that both the tongue and the stomach desire. Research has proven that chocolate can boost serotonin, and it can also stimulate secretions of endorphins. This work is mostly inspired by the notion of the conscious stomach, though it is also inspired by the ideas that humans are not individuals so much as clouds of intertwined human, bacterial, and now machine cells. We have evolved into hybrid symbiotic ecosystems that consist of trillions of living bacteria. So that is the enteric consciousness. The next work I'd like to show you is a work called the Paparazzi Robots. And one of the things that really fascinates me about the machines that we choose to surround us with is how they reform and change our conceptions of who we are and how we interact and exist. And one of the things most of you notice is that even if you're depressed, if somebody brings out a camera, suddenly we fake a smile or we act happy. So I'm interested in how the machines change how we perceive ourselves, but also we live in the age of the selfie moment. 
I started to ask questions about that, and I thought, oh, well, what could be more fun than a series of robots, called the paparazzi robots, that would seek you out and then only take a photograph of you if you smiled. It turns out that when you smile, there's a kind of reverse neurotransmitter of happiness that then is sent back to your brain. So in essence, these are also robots that make you happy. It's called the paparazzi robot. This was the 3D model that I sent to the curator in Russia. Uh, these were invited for a biennial in Russia. And uh, the curator, Dmitry Gulatov, was very kind. These were the original models. So again, it shows you a little bit about process. You'll see that they don't look exactly the Nazi bots are a series of five autonomous robots, each standing at the height of the average human comprised of multiple cameras, sensors, and robotic actuators on a custom-built rolling platform, they move at the speed of a walking human, avoiding walls and obstacles while using infrared sensors to move toward humans. They have ultrasonic sensors allowing them to see out to a distance of 13 feet in order to move toward passing subjects. The paparazzi robots seek one thing, which is to capture photos of people and to make these images available to the press and the World Wide Web as a statement of culture's obsession with the celebrity image and especially our own images. Each autonomous robot makes the decision to take the photos of particular people while ignoring other humans in the exhibition based on such things as whether or not the viewers are smiling or the shape of their smile. One of the things that really surprised me with that robot was how machine vision itself really didn't like my smile. And that really annoyed me. It likes my wife's smile because she has just a perfect balanced smile. Because mine was a little bit crooked, it just would not take my picture very often. So I felt rejected in a way by my robot. I found that in a lot of exhibitions, in fact, this one also went off to Toronto, that people got really annoyed by being rejected by the robot. In fact, I brought a grad student and somebody actually ran and tried to attack the robot out of absolute anger for the robot not taking their picture. So uh, one of the things I also do with these photos is I post them online. And I found that people really just love to see their own images. We love to see our images processed through the machine to change them. The next work I'd like to show you is a work called the Autotelematic Spider Bots. And this is an example of a robot that was completely designed in the space of um, the computer. So in essence, it was also given birth to by a computer, which interests me greatly, this idea that in the future we may have, I mean, we all know about you know, Toyota factories. In a way, a lot of times those are machines giving rise to other machines. You know, we all have science fiction notions of, uh, you know, uh, nasty robots that are going to kill us, and those are things we probably should be concerned with. But these particular robots were really inspired by a lecture I'd seen by a man who spoke about the rule-driven systems of ants. And I got very excited by that. I thought, wow, oh, well, ants are rule-driven systems, so they follow these criminal trails and one you know, goes back and it finds a trail and then leads the others to where the food was. And I thought, one of the really big problems with computer systems is how do they recharge themselves? I thought, maybe I could create a series of distributed robots where one would be able to find a recharge station on its own and then communicate back to the others in order to uh, then allow them to know where the recharge station was. So that began a process of 3D modeling and rapid prototyping. This was the model for the robot itself. This is a commission from a museum in England and uh, the Sunderland Gardens and, uh, Museum. And basically, I gave birth to 10 of these robots, or I should say the machine gave birth to 10 of the robots with my ideational DNA, I guess we could say. And these robots were basically march around the room and look for food. Um, they were able to communicate with the other robots as to where the source of the food was, which was the recharge station. The challenge was is that it took, I had one recharge station and it took roughly two hours per charge. So that was, in a way, a scientific question, but also an art question. It was a scientific question that I asked, but in a way, we could say it was a failure because I didn't have enough juice in the batteries to last. But it was a successful answer that indeed I was able to create a robot that could 
communicate to others with Bluetooth, and that they could self-organize themselves. This is, like many systems, going to have to wait for better batteries. Uh, many of you probably know that while companies like Boston Dynamics have amazing robots, uh, some of you have seen that giraffe robot, for example, open the door, you may or may not realize that some of these things can only last for 40, 50 minutes on a single charge. So batteries still remain one of our really big challenges with robotics, and especially robotic hardware. This is what they look like at the opening. They had light emitting diodes and flashed in the box. That they look roughly look like spiders that seek out their food like ants, but that seed like bats. Uh, as with spiders, they have multiple eyes. In this case, these spiders uh, have infrared eyes that are sending out a pulse of infrared light and looking for a frequency back. If you actually look at the robots, you'll see at the front of the robots, there's a couple of springs right here. And uh, as with the spider, the chelicerae of the spider brings the food into the mouth of the spider. Well, these are the chelicerae of the robot. And what happens is when the robot approaches a recharge station, it then connects between these two rails and then charges the battery up. They all talk with each other with Bluetooth, the communications technology. Uh, one of them can find a food source, for example, and it can then sing its food source back to the others uh, with this Bluetooth communications and then tell them where that food source is. There's a whole evolution happening within the realm of computing and technology, which is very much about somehow giving back emotional feedback to humans, because of course, as humans, we communicate with body languages and emotional responses and so on. For example, when you approach these robots and they see you, they Twitter to, to you and they give you an emotional response. So that's the auto-telematic spider robots. Um, one of the other things that really interests me in reading about science is reading about the brains of other creatures, creatures that we often dismiss as not really having great intelligence. Um, I was fortunate to uh, find one day a beautiful little betta fish in a glass of water in a store, a fish store, and I thought, oh my goodness, that just is the most beautiful little creature. It was kind of like Martha Graham as a fish or something. Um, it looked like it was recognizing me or having some recognition, but it really got me interested in fish intelligence. And so I started doing a lot more research, and what I discovered was that fish have a much greater intelligence than humans formerly thought. In fact, some of the foremost fish researchers on the planet say that not only do fish have long-term memories, but in fact they form very rich social relationships with others in a group. In fact, this researcher even said that sometimes a fish will actually form a Machiavellian plot against other fish to push them from the group. So fish are steeped in social intelligence. This got me to ask questions about, well, if I was that fish, what would I want to do? I'm stuck in a glass of water in the fish store. Well, I, I know what I want to do. I want to drive around at least and start interacting with other fish. So this is a Ken, why don't we have a moment here? Oh, that's a wonderful way of inviting the group to come into conversation about their experience of what it is that you're putting before us in such a genius way. Um, anybody have any thought or response? Agency, 
you see these robots just sort of walking up, they can pretty much drive themselves to a location. They go to grab a doorknob, and then they fall over. So the truth is, is that if I were to create a robotic cat, it would be an illusion of intelligence. The truth is, is that you know, we have cats and dogs and even fleas and insects are so far superior than anything we have on the planet right now. Even bacteria are so far superior. We're very good at creating the illusion of intelligence. And a lot of my works, in a way, are reactive. In a way, this one is one that uses the brains of the fish only to activate a car. But the system itself is actually fairly simple. It just says, oh, is there a fish there? Sure, then move this way. Is there a fish not there? Then don't move this way. I answer that. Yes, sir. I did have one more question. Sorry. Yes, sir. I just wanted to ask, um, so whenever you speak in terms of the good bacteria that helps us break down starches and so on and so forth in our digestive tract, uh, are you saying basically that digestive enzymes is, is an aggregation of different types of bacteria? Well, it's true that you can have both good and bad, bad, bad bacteria in your stomachs. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is actually we can't even absorb a lot of the foods that we eat. In fact, we need the bacteria to break it down further. Uh, the truth is, is that roughly 10 to 15 percent of what you eat or absorb into your bodies is actually a waste from bacteria. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, researchers that have talked about both eukaryotic and prokaryotic bacteria. The bacteria, in a way that uh, Lynn Margolis spoke about when the prokaryotic cells invaded eukaryotic cells and became mitochondria in our own cells. The mitochondria, of course, are the things in our own cells which generate adenosine triphosphate, which is the energy in itself. We couldn't, of course, survive without those things. So, and then, you know, so in a way, we really are agglomerations of lots of, you know, billions of years, in fact, of evolution that allow us to absorb the food that is from outside. So sure, it all impacts our stomachs. There's an irony, is there not, about bacteria, good bacteria, being killed by antibiotics. That's right. And so, uh, what is it that's going to evolve? Like, uh, Chemotherapy kills good cells as it kills cancer cells. So uh, as we evolve and you do your research, you come up to a solution for all of this, huh? Well, yeah, there's there's a lot of amazing research actually happening, you know, really throughout the world about our relationship with bacteria. And they know now, for example, that we feed our babies artificial milk versus natural milk. We understand that the baby is inoculated at birth when she has or he has her first drink of the mother's milk. And it's because not only is there fungi and bacteria in the mother's milk, but also in and around the nipple of the mother. So that's really fascinating that we need that bacteria to build up a healthy microbiome in our stomach. And our lung health, our body health is very much related to the microbiome. And the microbiome, of course, is not only the stomach, it's the underarm bacteria, it's the back bacteria, it's the hair bacteria, all of that protects us and makes us and inoculates us from all of the bad bacteria that's kept at bay by the good bacteria. But again, it breaks our notion of being individual, it makes us really acknowledge that, in fact, we are symbiotically intertwined with all these other beings. We don't want to use those antimicrobial soaps. They, in fact, make us unhealthy. We, in fact, are better off in a dirty home than a clean home, because a dirty home builds up your immune system. So we're starting to realize that we really need these things. We need these things in our environment. We don't want to scrub everything in ammonia and other toxins. We instead want to embrace them and say, wow, these are living things in and on me, and in fact, are me. How do I support them? If that's true, I must be really healthy. What was that? You and me if both. that's true, I must be really healthy. Your robots that was open for electricity, yeah. they, had you thought of marketing them to the, you know, like when the lines are down, and, you know, and where, where the little robots can go out there and look for the uh, down lines and stuff? Everybody hear that? Yeah. I, you know, you're just looking for juice. Yeah, it, it's a very complex question.
because when you actually start building robots, you you realize truthfully how good humans are. Yeah. The robots are very good at doing repetitive tasks. But well, well, the human, if he touches a big power line, he's dead. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you know, if that touches it, you know, you just gotta go get a new robotic, you know, or that's where we remake it. But would, would get that computer, if you set it in a normal room, would it go to your actual plug, you know, outlet? Well, we, we do have robots that can find their source, but imagine that you're a robot in the real world and your power source changes all the time. That's where it gets complex. You know, I know the electric car, you know, when, it, when you get the juice goes down, it's looking for a uh, charging station, you know, which I think is quite interesting. Yeah, but of course it's, it, it has um, GPS, and the, the charging stations don't change their location. When you say a GPS is kind of like a brain? It's where, a global position. You know, yeah, you know, it's like up there, and it's telling the computer. That's right. And it's kind of like a, it knows where it is. So what robots do well in is they do well in structured environments, but they don't do well in unstructured environments. So if, if a plug or something is located with GPS, then the computer and the robot can find it, or the car can say it's over here. But keep in mind, it's still the driver that's getting it to the plug. But, but the whole thing is they got little things that you can go around and knowing where the plugs are without seeing the plugs. You, you know, the computer or the robots had that, and they would be searching for the plug, right? No, it, it's, uh, I can promise you, in our research and read about this, it's much more complex than we imagine. So believe me, everybody is trying to do that. But already we we have self-driving cars, but you have to realize that even these self-driving cars are not as intelligent as we believe. They need a lot of onboard sensors. And again, an unstructured environment is the most difficult thing for a robot. You, you, you know, if you go to a lot of the factories where the Amazon's a um, MSI technology has got tons of computers and CNC mails and, and the people they're constantly checking the work of the computer on CNC mails. Maybe we should let this gentleman also ask a question. He's going to ask raising his hand. I was, was going to ask, so when you come up with your concept, how do you come up with the design for the robot? Is it something that just I was saying, when you come up with your concept of what you are trying to build or accomplish, how do you come up with a design for the robot? Is it something that just spontaneously comes about as you build, or is it something that you think about beforehand, or is, is the structure of your design supposed to you know, like uh, reinforce the concept in a certain way? Can you explain that? I think that's a really great question. It's true that concepts drive everything robot here, which is the fish robot, that it came out of actually observing a fish and looking and asking a question about the nature of the fish. So you'll see this is the 3D design. This is the actual robot. They're, they're not exactly the same, but they're close. You know, this is, again, the actual robot. This is the 3D design. So it does. It comes out of a question, but it also comes out of, I'll turn this down, it also comes out of a asking questions about like, what kind of technologies are available to me. Um, you know, keeping a fish happy in the lives is a very complex thing. As keeping a spider alive is a complex thing. And so the first thing I always ask with these works is, what does the fish want? I, say, I have to say, what does the fish want? Because it's not a work about you know, hurting or scaring the fish, but it's like, the fish wants oxygen. Oh, so clearly I need a plant in there generate oxygen and make it feel natural. The fish also is afraid of the Siamese fighting fish. It's afraid of noise in the water because in the process of this, I discovered that the sound travels very quickly through metal and through water. So I put very soft foam wheels in this robot. The fish also doesn't like quick movement. So the maximum speed of this robot is basically about this fast. I think she has. So, you know, in a way, all of those are like questions that come out of the original question. But the question of what the animal wants, including the human animal, you know, looking at the paparazzi robots, it's like, well, what do humans want? 
we like seeing ourselves through technology. So I made a robot that makes people smile, captures their photos. Um, or in the case of the fish, it's like, well, the fish want to eat other fish. So I made a robot where they can meet each other across the gap and realize they could be fighting to the death. Usually what happens with these fish. But the other thing is that people often doubt that fish are in fact intelligent. And I'm going to show you a video now that shows you how intelligent they are. Oh, so let's show Piece. Around the back here. 